Hello everyone. In this video, let us learn about the soft tissue calcifications and ossifications in the maxillofacial region. Although there are several types of calcification, the diagnosis of this should not be difficult. I'll show you several examples of these conditions. At the end of the video, you should be able to arrive at a good radiographic diagnosis of the most common kinds of calcifications. Because many radiographic features are subtle, I recommend that you watch this video on a large screen, ideally a desktop screen. However, instead of keeping it at the default size, you may want to fill up the screen. A desktop screen is ideal to see the detailed features of a radiograph. A laptop screen is also good. You may also watch it on a tablet. If you watch these videos on a smartphone, you may not get the best benefit. These videos are created at a 4K resolution. If possible, please watch it at the highest resolution. I will try to show you best examples of diseases that I have in my teaching file. Some of the images are given freely to me by many generous colleagues. I'll try to acknowledge them as I go along. Briefly, we can classify soft tissue calcifications into several categories. Some calcifications may be dystrophic. Some of the calcification in the maxillofacial region may be idiopathic. Some calcifications and ossifications can be classified as heterotopic. I'll also show you examples of several kinds of foreign bodies that are commonly seen in the maxillofacial region. Some of these may mimic soft tissue calcifications. Finally, we'll also discuss some of the normal anatomic landmarks that may confuse the clinician as areas of abnormal calcification. Similar to any kind of diagnostic procedure, you'll also need to develop a systematic approach to diagnosing soft tissue calcifications and ossifications. If you employ a good system, diagnosing soft tissue calcification is rather simple. Most important in the diagnostic process is to identify the location of the calcification. You will be able to rule out many types of calcification only by the location. Some calcifications are solitary, while some others are multiple. This is also an important clue in the diagnostic procedure. The shape of the calcification also provides an important clue to the diagnosis. Some calcifications are frequently circular. Some are linear while some are oval. You will also pay attention to the orientation of the calcification. We will see that carotid calcifications are usually vertical, while a stylohyoid ligament calcification is usually at about 45 degrees. Finally, the density of the calcification also provides important information about the diagnosis. Calcification of the tonsils may be uniformly dense, while a flebolite has a bull's eye appearance with the appearance of layers. Let's start with dystrophic calcifications. These are calcium deposits into sites of inflammation or into sites of dead or dying tissues. Frequently, we'll see such calcifications in areas that had inflammations many years ago. Therefore, during your clinical encounter, these patients may be asymptomatic. These calcifications may be quite small or fairly large. The first condition that we'll learn is the calcification of the lymph nodes. Since this is a dystrophic calcification, we understand that these calcifications are results of chronic inflammation. The patient most likely is currently asymptomatic Therefore, the radiographic findings can be incidental. The most common sites are the locations of the submandibular or cervical lymph nodes. Radiographically, these will appear as multiple well-defined circular radiopacities. These radiopacities are grouped together. Frequently, these will appear similar to a bunch of grapes. At the late stage, the distinct Multiple radiopacities may not remain as these calcifications group tighter together. 
At the late stages, you will have a lobulated mass with almost an uniform density with well-defined margins. Here is one example of lymph node calcification. The location is critical for the diagnosis. The radio opacities are near the angle of the mandible. These are multiple roughly circular radiopic masses. These masses have grouped together. The imaginary outline is almost oval. You may visualize these calcifications similar to a bunch of grapes. This is another example of a lymph node calcification. Again, these are multiple radiopic masses grouped together, giving an appearance of bunch of grapes. The location remains critical for the diagnosis. These calcifications are near the angle of the mandible. We see these masses are superimposed over the hyoid bone. This radiograph was kindly given to me by my good friend, Dr. Mel Muparapu, Professor of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dentistry. Let me try to draw the location of the lymph node calcifications. I'll make multiple circular radio opacities, a little bit distal and inferior to the angle of the mandible. In late stage, these radio opacities may appear uniformly dense, almost look like a cauliflower instead of bunch of grapes. Let's review tonsillar calcifications. Again, the location is critical for diagnosis. The tonsillar calcifications can be superimposed over the ramus on a panoramic radiograph. Some of these calcifications are located distal of the ramus will review a CBCT scan. On the CBCT scan, we'll see the calcifications on the lingual aspect of the ramus. Lymph node calcifications were near the angle of the mandible. Tonsillar calcifications are superimposed over the ramus of the mandible. Similar to a lymph node calcification, the tonsillar calcifications are also multiple, but these are irregular in size. These calcifications are discrete. Unlike lymph node calcifications, tonsillar calcifications are not grouped together. The tonsillar calcifications are typically seen in elderly people. As you can see, multiple radio opacities of various sizes are superimposed over the rami on both sides. These are not grouped together. The radio opacity near the apex of the mandibular second premolar is not a tonsillar calcification. This radiopacity does not fit the location of tonsillar calcification, which will be superimposed over the ramus. This radiopacity near the apex of the premolar is idiopathic osteosclerosis, also known as dense bone island. This is not a calcification in the soft tissues. On this panoramic radiograph, we see tonsillar calcifications bilaterally, more prominent on the left side. Some of these calcifications are superimposed beyond the distal margin of the ramus. Because the tonsillar calcifications are on the pharyngeal soft tissues, they do not have to be superimposed over the ramus. As you can see, some of the calcifications are larger than the others. On this radiograph, again, we see bilateral tonsillar calcifications. This time, the calcifications are larger on the right side. The patient is partially edentulous, about 65 years old. I am not putting a circle over the radio opacities, expecting that you have already identified these tonsillar calcifications. Now let's review a CBCT scan to appreciate the relationship of the tonsillar calcifications with the ramus. Here is an example of tonsillar calcification as we view on the coronal aspects. We have left ramus, right ramus, 
these are areas of multiple calcifications about 17 millimeters from the lingual cortical plate of the ramus on the right side also about 17 millimeters and you can appreciate multiple radio opacities on the axial slices you can see multiple radio opacities on the pharyngeal soft tissues <laughs> and here on the sagittal views this is the right side multiple calcifications let's try to draw tonsillar calcification i think such drawings help us remember the diagnostic clues let's put some irregular radio opacities over the middle third of the ramus unlike the lymph node calcifications i have made these outlines fairly irregular some are larger than the others maybe we can add a few more beyond the distal margin of the ramus let's review another kind of calcification this time let us identify the calcifications of the blood vessels these calcifications can be divided into two types arteriosclerosis and calcification of the atherosclerotic plaques on this cropped panoramic radiograph of the right side we can see a faint evidence of arteriosclerosis inferior to the mandibular angle these are parallel radio opacities at the end of the vessel we almost see a cross-sectional appearance like a ring on this radiograph please follow my cursor to see the arteriosclerosis let me start from here can see that this is a parallel band of radio opacities. The arteriosclerosis on the right side is less defined but we can still see it. Let us trace it. The outline is still parallel, showing the sclerosis of the walls of the vessels. The calcifications of the atherosclerotic plaques are mostly seen in the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. The bifurcation is about 45 degrees from the angle of the mandible in front of cervical vertebra C3 and C4. The calcifications are on the walls of the canal typically oriented vertically think this calcification as an old plumbing pipe that has rusted only on the inner surface you may see irregular parallel lines previously when we saw arteriosclerosis the calcifications were smooth parallel lines in case of the calcification of atherosclerotic plaques the calcification is irregular the outer margins representing the walls of the vessels are usually smooth. Here is an example of the calcification of atherosclerotic plaques in an elderly patient. The calcifications pointed by the arrows are about 45 degrees from the angle of the mandible. These calcifications are roughly parallel, roughly vertical and irregular. They have an appearance of uneven parallel lines. Another example of calcification of atherosclerotic plaques, again in an elderly patient. We can see bilateral calcifications about 45 degrees from the angle of the mandible. These calcifications are roughly vertical, irregular, with a hint of uneven parallel lines. For ease of remembering, let's draw the calcifications of atherosclerotic plaques. Let me draw a roughly vertical opacity, say about 45 degrees from the angle of the mandible. Let's add another one vertically. I did not join these two together. 
Let's put something on the distal wall of the vessel. Maybe one more. Roughly parallel, vertical, irregular, with fairly smooth outer borders. Let's review a CBCT scan, paying attention to the axial slices. On the axial slices, we will see the circular appearance of the vessel. Let's look at this axial view to identify the carotid calcification. This is the left calcified carotid atheroma. This is the right side of the calcified carotid atheroma. Let's scroll through these images to see the circular appearance of the vessel. You can see that the vessels are close to the cervical vertebrae. The next structure that we are going to learn is the calcification of the pineal gland. The pineal gland is a neuronal structure located at the midline of the brain between the two cerebral hemispheres. Calcification of the pineal gland can be visible on cross-sectional imaging such as a CBCT scan. Several reports have indicated a prevalence rate of about 10 to 60 percent. These calcifications are slightly more in males. Clinical reports have suggested that pineal gland calcifications affect sleep patterns and may also have a role in the sense of direction. This image on the left is a sagittal slice through the midline of the cranium. The irregular area of radiopacity is the pineal gland calcification. This calcification is posterior and superior to the cella tarsica or pituitary fossa. The image on the right is a coronal slice at the level of the mastoid air cells. Again, we can see the calcification of the pineal gland at the midline of the brain. Now let's consider some idiopathic calcifications in the maxillofacial region. We will discuss four different calcifications. The silolith or calcifications within the ducts of the salivary glands. Flibolith or calcification of intravascular thrombus. Entrolith or calcification in the antrum or sinus. And rhinolith or calcification in the nose. Let's start with silolith. Silolith or salivary duct calcifications are mostly from obstruction of the salivary duct. Sometimes the obstruction may be from a mucus plug. The mucus plug may also become calcified. Most siloliths are visible in the submandibular duct because saliva from submandibular gland has higher mineral content. Silolith of the parotid duct is less common. A silolith is usually a well-defined, uniformly dense radiopacity superimposed over the inferior border of the mandible. Since part of this radiopacity is outside the border of the mandible, we can rule out dense bone island or idiopathic osteosclerosis that occurs inside the bone. Occasionally, a silolith may be completely superimposed over the mandible. To rule out a dense bone island, a peripical radiograph or an occlusal radiograph may be obtained. If this is a silolith, this will probably not be recorded on a peripical radiograph. An occlusal radiograph should show this radiopacity on the lingual aspect of the mandible. This radiograph shows bilateral silolith, again superimposed over the inferior border of the mandible. Parts of this silolith are beyond the outline of the mandible. Unlike a lymph node calcification, which is the appearance of a cauliflower, the margin of the silolith is usually smooth. A lymph node calcification is less likely to superimpose over the inferior border of the mandible. A silolith may be uniformly radiopaque or may have multiple layers. This radiograph shows a massive silolith on the left side. 
This cellulite is almost uniformly radio opaque. The margin of the cellulite is mostly smooth and well defined. This radiograph was shared with me with one of my previous students, Dr. Andrew White. Thank you, Andrew. This is the other appearance of a cellulite with multiple layers. Again, this large cellulite is superimposed over the inferior border of the mandible. Often a cellulite is solitary, but in some cases there may be more than one cellulite on one side. This radiograph was shared with me by one of my previous students, Dr. Bangu. Thank you, Harkor. On this extraoral bite wing radiograph, two cellulites are present on the right side. The margins of these are again smooth. The internal content shows multiple layers. On the right side, we have a large uniformly dense cellulite extending from the area of the premolars to the area of the second molars. The fuzzy radio opacity superimposed over the left posterior mandible is a ghost image. You may also identify a calcified carotid etheroma plaque on the left side. Let's see how does this cellulite appear on an occlusal radiograph. This cross-sectional occlusal radiograph shows the massive cellulite on the right side. Again, the outline is smooth. The elongated shape conforms to the shape of a salivary duct. This is completely radiopaque without any evidence of layering. Let's draw the appearance of a cellulite. Most of the time, a cellulite is oval or linear with a uniform density and superimposed over the inferior border of the mandible. Occasionally, a cellulite has multiple layers. The mass still has a smooth outer border. This mass is superimposed over the inferior border of the mandible. Let's review a cellulite on a cross-sectional imaging. Let's look at this coronal view to identify a cellulite on the left side. The cellulite would be on the lingual aspect of the mandible. And here is the large cellulite. Please pay attention to the outer margin, which is smooth and well defined. And you can see that this cellulite has multiple layers. Now we see another calcification superiorly here, and that's a tonsillar calcification. These are tonsillar calcifications. So we may have multiple calcifications on the same patient. This is the cellulite, and these are the tonsillar calcifications. Parotid cellulites are rare. As you can expect, the parotid gland being on the buccal aspect of the mandible, you will also see the cellulite on the buccal aspect of the ramus. Again, the outline is smooth and well defined. The cellulite has uniform density. Another example of a parotid cellulite, this time on the right side. On a lateral skull or on a panoramic radiograph, a cellulite may be superimposed over the ramus. Earlier we had seen tonsillar calcifications. Tonsillar calcifications are multiple. A parotid cellulite is usually solitary. A flebolite is a calcification in an old thrombus or hemangioma. Radiographically, these are oval or circular with a smooth outer border. At the center, there is an area of increased density, giving an appearance of a bull's eye or a target. Usually, these are multiple. Unlike other calcifications, flebolites do not have any location preference. This can be in any area of the maxillofacial region. On these intraoral radiographs, you may see multiple circular radiopacities. Let's use this radio opacity with a yellow marker as an example. It is circular with a smooth outer border. 
At the center, there is an area of radio opacity. Overall, the appearance is similar to a bull's eye. On this panoramic radiograph, we see multiple radio opacities near the angle of the mandible. Earlier, we had learned about lymph node calcification. Lymph node calcifications grouped together to form the shape of a bunch of grapes. In this example, these multiple radio opacities have not grouped together. In the case of lymph node calcifications, the radio opacities are usually uniform. In this example, pointed by the arrow, the radio opacity has a bull's eye appearance. Tonsillar calcification can also be multiple. However, the tonsillar calcifications are superimposed over the middle third of the ramus. Tonsillar calcifications do not have a smooth circular shape. On this radiograph, we see another example of a flibolet. Again, the example lesion is circular with the central core of radio opacity. These masses have different sizes. Let's draw a flibolet. Because these are in different areas, so I am going to draw this at the level of the occlusal surfaces. It's a circular radio opacity with a central core. Let me make a smaller one, maybe a slightly bigger oval shaped. Another one. So this would be appearance of a flibolet. You may want to draw this in any areas because flibolets do not have any site preference. Entrolith is a calcification inside the sinus or antrum. These calcifications have an irregular shape and uniform density. Because these are inside the sinuses, we have to look for radio opacities above the floor of the maxillary sinuses. If there is a missing tooth, we have to rule out displaced root fragment inside the sinus. The root tips are usually conical. To rule out a root tip, try to identify the presence of a pulp canal. This well-defined circular radio opacity is superimposed over the left maxillary sinus. This does not have the shape of a root tip. All the roots are present, including the root of the carious maxillary left third molar. If this was a radio opacity inside the nasal fossa, the outline would be fuzzy. The best way to locate is to obtain another radiograph at 90 degree view or obtain a cross-sectional imaging such as CBCT. Here is another example of an entrolith. This irregular, uniformly dense radio opacity is near the floor of the right maxillary sinus. The third molar is missing in this area. To rule out a root tip, let's use cross-sectional imaging. On this coronal views, we can see that this radio opacity does not have any morphological similarity to a root. Although there is an area of radiolucency, this do not conform to the shapes of pulp canal. Occasionally, you may see an entrolith on a periapical radiograph. This is a well-defined radio opacity with some evidence of layering. Again, this does not have a shape of a retained root tip. Also, there is no evidence of a pulp canal. Rhinoliths are calcification of mucosa in the nasal cavity. On a panoramic or a periapical radiograph, this may appear as an entrolith. A 90 degree view confirms the location of a rhinolith. This nice example of a rhinolith was given to me by Dr. Gorlin. This circular radio opacity is actually a plastic bead that a child had pushed into her nose. The bead remained in the nose for almost a year and eventually created a calcified layer around it. Heterotopic calcification or ossification are normal bone in abnormal locations. These are organized bone in soft tissues. Because these are organized bone, 
they may show cortical plates, trabecular patterns, and marrow spaces. Let's consider stylohyoid ligament ossification. These ossifications are usually bilateral. The ligaments may be completely opacified or may have pseudo joints. The border is usually smooth except in areas of the pseudo joints. On this panoramic radiograph, the patient has bilaterally ossified stylohyoid ligaments. On the left side, as pointed by the yellow arrow, there is evidence of a pseudo joint. The origin is at the level of the styloid process. The structure is oriented towards the hyoid bone. Here we can see a right sided ossified styloid ligament. In addition, there are multiple radio opacities superimposed over the ramus. These are the tonsillar calcifications. On the right side, we see a nice example of a pseudo joint. On the left side, a part of the ligament has not calcified. The left image is a custom slice through the length of the ossified right stylohyoid ligament. The image shows two locations of pseudo joints. The right image is a thick coronal section showing extensive ossification of both stylohyoid ligaments. I am pointing the red arrows to the location of the pseudo joints. Let me draw an ossified stylohyoid ligament. Remember that the ligament is at about 45 degree angle. Let me make it smooth and almost parallel. I think I should add a pseudo joint and continue further down. You may want to differentiate calcified stylohyoid ligament with the calcification of carotid atheromas. Let's review what we had drawn earlier. We had drawn carotid calcification as almost vertical irregular entities about 45 degrees from the angle of the mandible. In comparison, the stylohyoid ligament calcifications are smooth, well defined and located distal to the ramus. Note the difference in the orientation of these two entities. Let's identify another area of opacity, the triticious cartilage. Triticia means a grain of wheat. Appropriate to its name, this radio opacity is oval. Triticious cartilage is located inferior to the hyoid bone. Let's use a line diagram to understand this location. Between the hyoid bone and the superior corner of the thyroid is a ligament called thyrohyoid ligament. In the center of the thyrohyoid ligament is an oval cartilage, the triticious cartilage. I have pointed the triticious cartilage with the red arrow. Here is another example of triticious cartilage. This cartilage is located inferior to the hyoid and anterior to the cervical vertebra. One more example of the triticious cartilage. This oval cartilage is located inferior to the hyoid and anterior to the cervical vertebrae. One more example of triticious cartilage pointed by the white arrow. Now it should be easy for you to identify this cartilage. Osteoma cutis is rare ossification of the cutaneous tissues. These may appear in areas of chronic acne, scar or inflammation. Although this is most common on the facial skin, sometimes we see osteoma in the tongue in the mucosal layer. Osteoma cutis is very faint. Let me go slowly over multiple osteoma cutis. The left image is an axial view at the level of the mandibular symphysis. The right image is a sagittal view at the midline of the mandible. The arrows pointed to the areas of osteoma cutis. 
The radiographs of the soft tissues of the cheek show multiple osteoma cutis. I am showing you only a few of these with yellow arrows. Sometimes a soft tissue normal anatomy may appear like a radiopacity. Prominent ear lobes sometimes appear as unusual structures. This is a normal anatomy and should not be confused with any kind of disease. A well calcified superior corner of the thyroid may appear as an unusual area of calcification. A well calcified superior corner of the thyroid may appear as an unusual area of calcification. This is a variation of normal anatomy. This should not be confused with trititious cartilage. This is the hyoid and superimposed over the hyoid is the superior corner of the thyroid. Angle of the mandible is here. Foreign bodies may also appear in the soft tissues while a metal fragment related to trauma can be easily identified on a radiograph. Less dense materials such as glass or plastic may appear as soft tissue calcifications. Botox and other cosmetics may also appear as soft tissue calcifications. This coronal slice shows multiple radiopacities in the facial region. These widespread irregular radiopacities are features of Botox injection. These axial slices are from different patients who had received Botox injections. These are irregular widespread radiopacities of varying densities. The diagnosis can be easily achieved with a clinical history. In several cultures, fine gold fibers are inserted in the facial regions as cosmetics. The fine radiopacities are gold fibers. This 3D reconstruction shows the multiple gold fibers. These subdermal gold fibers are superficial and not in contact with the cortical bone. This is an excellent example of subdermal gold wires recorded on a peripical radiograph. These white lines are not defects on the radiographic film or a sensor. This patient was involved in a motor vehicle accident. The windshield had fragmented. Small pieces of glass were embedded in the cheek. These fragments may appear as osteoma cutis. Clinical information was helpful in differentiating glass fragments from osteoma cutis. Let us try to identify this radiopaque band. This is almost at a 45 degree angle. Can it be a stylohyoid ligament calcification? However, you can see that this radiopic band extend past the hyoid bone. As you identify the anatomic landmarks, the styloid process is actually superimposed over the ear. So this radiopic entity that we saw cannot be a stylohyoid ligament. Further, we see a radiopaque entity at the inferior part of this radiopaque band. You are correct if you have identified this as a drainage shunt. Here is another example of a drainage shunt on the lateral skull radiograph. If you see an entity that is perfectly parallel, it is unlikely to be part of the human body. 
This is the end of the unit on soft tissue calcifications and ossifications. Thank you very much for listening and learning from this unit. I hope you will join me again for another unit in oral and maxillofacial radiology. See you. Thank you.